Hello, and welcome to another episode of Film Independent Presents. I am your host and moderator, Carla Renata, and I'd like to thank our take this time to thank our lead partners, the Golden Globe Foundation. My mouth is not working with me today. I don't know what's happening. Anywho, um, we are here to talk about a fantabulous independent film called Memory, which stars Miss Jessica Chastain and Mr. Peter Sarsgaard. So welcome, you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks Hi. for having us. Hi. So I watched the film and I was blown away by your performances. Both of you all, I've seen numerous things of your works in the zeitgeist of your career. And you all are excellent at giving these understated, nuanced performances that speak so loud, but say everything all at once but even more so with this particular film with Saul and Sylvia. So I just want to get into it real quick at the start, talking about how you built the nuanced performances before, for these two characters, especially for Saul, because he doesn't have a whole lot to say, but he does. Yeah, I mean, what Saul wants is so human that it was a joy to play. I mean, he wants connection. Um, he doesn't want to be put in the grave before he's dead. He wants life. Um, he lives in the moment because he can't remember the previous moment, you know, and he meets this woman who's who's got so much going on, but of course I forget her whole past a lot of the time. This is somebody who's, whose memory of what's happened to her is really causing her problems in the present. And I'm of course somebody who can't hold that memory with her. So it's a very interesting relationship. And I think for me, just in terms of preparing for it, I just felt like I got out of the way. You know, I had an uncle who had dementia who I was close with. I knew something about it. His was pretty mild for years. Um, and I talked to people who had dementia on the telephone because it felt like a kinder way. You know, it's it's strange to meet someone and say, I'm studying the part of you that is broken. It, it's awkward. And um, these are people that volunteered for, through a doctor. And uh, yeah, it was a joy to play him. It's a joy to play someone who wants life. It was a joy to watch. Jessica, can you speak to how you crafted Sylvia for a second? Yeah, I you know, with Sylvia, so much is about how we meet her and how she walks through her life and what she leads with. And she really leads with trauma. She leads with the memory of her past. She leads with shame um, and, and the, you know, being a, a, a sober person. And she has been for 13 years. I had to really fill out the blanks of what her life has been like starting from when she was a child the to make it as a, as specific as possible you know the questions of what exactly happened to her um what was her relationship like with her sister what did her parents smell like what did their house look like um what happened to school oh, all of these things Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but when you said what her parents smell like, that's such a very specific objective and intention to have that I can, when you said that, I could totally see how you did that in my head. I flipped right back to the, the film and saw you do that. I'm sorry, please continue. I just got so excited when I heard you say that. Well, it's it's the thing of like, when you make something feel as though you understand these memories as your own it help for it helps me play the character like i didn't make certain choices that i see on screen and they happened because of the the preparation i did so like even the idea of when someone walks by sylvia she moves back she doesn't want to be touched like the idea that her skin hurts when someone touches her even her daughter i don't you know she's not someone who's really like a cuddling her daughter uh and when you have this kind of uber sensitivity to other human beings 
how can you then learn to start to open and start to lead your life without putting the trauma in front of you? And I think it's so beautiful that the way she's able to do that is to meet someone who sees her new each moment by each moment. And they don't see her from her past and what she's walking in with. They don't see Sylvia with shame. He sees her as she is in that moment. And in, in you become sometimes how someone looks at you and she's starting to look at herself the way Saul can see her. There's two, thank you for, for answering that for me and elaborating on it. That was a beautiful answer. Thank you so much. There's two moments that really stick out in my mind with Sylvia and Saul. The first one is in the park where she goes full throttle and is like, you don't remember me? Why don't you remember me? And the for lack of a better way to say it, the attack dogness of the, of the dogma that she comes at him with that. And he never reciprocates it. He stays in this Zen Buddha kind of place because he more so than anyone else recognizes where he is. So I say all of that to say, did you all improv that scene or was that all on the page that you brought to the performance? On the page. Yeah, that was a very complete scene. That scene was really like it was very well written. There, there is a scene. Yeah, it was it was like down to I love that at the end I'm like, well, if you say that that's something I did, then we can say that's something I did. <laughs> like I'm going to, you know, it's it because the, the the thing that I know is Saul is that my memory for things a long time ago is pretty good. I know where I went to school, I know all kinds of things. Even my memory for recent things isn't a disaster you know um so it's it made me have to question my own dementia in a way and that scene where I'm going like I think I know who I am and I think I'm a person that doesn't do things like that and I have no memory of having done that but you seem like you really think I did it (laughs) So now I will become that. And I, I, that's something that we all do for each other, right? You, you think you know who you are, but then the world mirrors something else back at you, right? And it might be accurate or it might just be messing with your mind and you should stick with what you think. So that idea was really played out so beautifully in that scene because she's really, the way you come at me in the scene too is like, it's not just taking my head off. It's like, oh, cut off a fingernail and now we're, we're going to have She's to go for the whole finger. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> we might need a Band-Aid. We might need some stitches. We don't, we're not quite sure. Okay. Might need a body bag. Yeah. Uh, but also the wonderful way that uh, Michelle shoots is because we're both in the shot at the same time. Mm-hmm. I came into that scene as Sylvia. I was so excited to finally get there, to finally like... You know, there's a sense of like Lee of like, this is my moment. And then to play the scene and I I learned so much actually watching the film afterwards to play the scene and see the way Saul is so kind of Zen and calm and the difference in energy, he doesn't match her energy. And then it completely, all of a sudden, the power that she came in with, this warrior, I gonna fix this, it, in some sense makes her feel victimized again, even though nothing's happened to her, but there's a there's an emotional loss. So like, I can't even have this moment. And I didn't see that on the page. I didn't see that until I was in the scene with Peter. And that's the beautiful thing about working with an actor who's so open that you discover things about your character you didn't anticipate. I mean, the exact opposite of what's on the page is also happening, which is they're connecting. Now it might seem like it's a horrible connection, but they're speaking the truth, both of them in the scene. Yeah. This happened. I don't think it happened. Okay. I, okay. I'm listening to you. I'm trying yeah. to, I'm listening. And that kind of interaction is, I think, something neither of them have done that much yeah. of. I've been living by myself with my brother who barely says anything to me, you know? And and she's been living in this very closeted world. And um, I think this is like the beginning of something, even though it looks like the end of something, you know, at some level, when I watch the movie again. I agree with everything that both of you said. That's why I asked you about this thing, because I knew there was a lot to it. And I really 
want people who've seen it to be able to get what was behind it. Because I watched, when I finished watching it, I was like, I really need to know about this scene. The other scene I need to know about is the one where he shows up at your job and says he wants to yeah. talk to you. And y'all step outside yeah. and y'all just <laughs> in each other's faces, looking in each other's faces. Yeah. When I tell you the emotion that jumps off the screen and the energy that jumps off the screen between the two of you in that scene, again, I'm going to ask, was that scripted or was that improv? And did he, did, did the director just let the camera roll and get what he needed to get? Talk to me about it. The kiss was scripted. All of that was scripted. But we shot it twice. Yeah. We actually shot it. And he does this thing where he builds in extra days at the end. So he's largely shooting this thing in order. And then he has a couple days at the end for new scenes, reshoots of scenes, things like that, just a little bit. And he doesn't always use all of it, I guess. But he, I think that was one of the ones where we were like, oh, let's go back and do that scene one more time. <laughs> so we did that whole bit on two separate days. I loved it. It was a, it was beautiful. It was so, 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 so beautiful. Um, I want to talk about that song that is, I, I'm going to call it Saul's song for lack of a better way to say it, but it's literally the title of it is called The Whiter Shade, Shade of Fail. Um, what is the meaning of that song for Saul? And then it ends up having a double meaning for Saul and Sylvia by the time the film ends. It's my wife is the meaning of that song. That song is totally connected to my wife. I say, my wife loved the Hammond organ. I, just, I said, basically, she loves the song. I played the song over and over. I think that song is my connection to my wife. And I do think my wife is a real presence in the movie for me. You know, it's, it motivates a lot of the different things that I do. But what ends up happening is, you know, he moves through it and it becomes, it, it, it winds up at her feet, you know? So I think by the end of that song to me changes into not the song about my wife, but the song for connection, mm -hmm. you know? And it's not like at the end of the movie, you're like, wow, wow, he's thinking about his wife, you know, like it's, it's, um, it's that love can do that. You can have all this love and the person can pass away. It's not going anywhere can move on to someone else and uh it's a it's a subtle thing that's in the movie I think um you can tell me but I like it it is subtle it is subtle but just like you all like I said about you all and your performances it's understated but it's powerful and it says a lot without saying anything at all you know what I mean like you very you very faintly hear the song the only time you hear it really loudly is when he's laying in the bed and the, the phone is right there and he's just hitting the phone and putting it on repeat, you know? I, I And I love that that was the only music that was in the film, was that song. I just love that. I love nuance. I love specificity when it when it comes to, to these types of films. Um, speaking of which, something that I thought was interesting yeah. about Sylvia's character is that she's 13 years sober. She's got three locks on the door. Like what's up with her and threes in, in her life? Like the, the three with the locks, the three with the 13 years sober, the fact that she, she's, she is tough, but she's vulnerable all at the same time, which struck me hard when you find Saul in the street, right? And you turn your back to him. When I realized the film was taking place in New York, and this man was on the ground and you turned your back. I'm like, Jessica Chastain, I know you didn't turn your back on somebody that's sitting on the ground in New York City. I know you didn't just, <laughs> I know you didn't just do that. Back to him? What do you mean? Like when she first- you, When you were on the phone. So you turned your back to him when you were on the phone. It's because she's with the daughter. The, what do you mean when the daughter comes out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's No, even before the daughter came out, you just for a slight second, you turned your back. You turned your back a couple of times, but it was enough for me to notice it. And I was like, you in I New think, York City and you turning your back on somebody on the ground? I think I could always see him. I always, I could turn to the side, but I think he was always in my No, I see someone who's hyper vigilant in that scene. <laughs> like, 
Okay. No, take, even, it, take it easy. Even when the brother <laughs> shows up and puts him in the car, I like she can't even be next to him. So yeah, there's definitely some kind of force field where she um, has a huge layer of protection, a barrier. Okay. All right. I'll take that. When you guys have the scene, <laughs> y'all are laughing at me. You're funny. Um, when you have the scene with your parents, where it's you and Saul and your daughter and your parents and your sister, and your sister finally has your back for the first time ever in your life. What did that feel like for Sylvia? Because Sylvia all this time has been saying, this is my story. This is what happened. Why do you all keep saying that, that, that this didn't happen and that I'm making it up when you know that this is true? Like, why are you doing that? I mean, that was an incredibly painful scene. I can't even talk about it without getting emotional because I think about it, it's so painful to film that scene. <laughs> I know that it was like painful it. to watch. And even the aftermath of it was painful to watch where you're in the, the tub and you just, like, you just can't, she just can't find the words to even express. It, yeah. it, it, watching it, it felt like she was experiencing grief, relief, like oh, just a wave smorgasbord of emotions that couldn't have any words attached to them, you know? Yeah, I we keep we keep freezing on the camera, but also I think what um I know you're saying relief and grief, but I think there's also betrayal there too. Like I know the sisters has said something, but there's the betrayal of for years struggling on your own and um you know, her dealing with addiction and abuse from other people and all of these things. And everyone treating her like she's the crazy one and she's done all these horrible things and she's a, a problem for the family, you know, an obstacle to the family. She's the problem child. So, yes, is the relief of finally the truth is out there, but it's also the betrayal of for 40 years. She's been ignored and denied that moment so it feels it's a it's a great betrayal I think also from the sister um of that whole life that they've had together but the beautiful way that Merritt plays it is you see too that she it be just by chance of living in the house and being around it is was com was absolutely abused herself and the marriage she finds herself in and and how she walks through the world is is a, as a damaged human being as well yeah, Merritt does a beautiful job. So does Josh. They, but every, every, all of you all, it's a really strong um, cast of characters that are very understated and strong all the way through from beginning to end, whether their mouths are open and speaking or not. So I appreciated that. At some point in the film, I heard someone say, the past is unstable and so is the present. What does that mean for both of you on the other side of this project? That the past is on who says that the past and the present are both unstable. The oh, past dear. is unstable, and so is the present. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that for me, um, you know, the past is always a story that I'm making as I go along, you know, and it kind of becomes that for all of us. And that's one of the the unfortunate things about the past, right? That we, we the way we remember is all a little bit different. Um, I always feel like the only thing I really have is the present moment. And the mm -hmm. present moment is the only place that's stable for me. And mm -hmm. it's what I do for a living. And on some level, you know, like homework is the past, which I then mostly forget. My I used to have this great acting teacher who really was the main person who helped me learn how to do this. Her name was Penny Allen. And I would go and work with her and we would- Al Pacino's acting teacher as well. Totally, yeah, yeah. I would go and I would like write through the, we'd write up the script, right? She's saying all kinds of stuff. And then I never, ever would go back and read any of it. I would go and do a scene and I'd be like, oh, I should go see what we wrote down. And then I'd be like, eh, because that's that's not right now. That's just something I thought then. And maybe it's in there somewhere rattling around. You know, I've thought about it. And uh, yeah, so for to, to me, that's why I do what I do is because 
I feel very confident and stable in the present reality. How about you, Jessica? Yeah, I think the only thing that is stable and true is that nothing is stable and true. <laughs> is that we can think we have control over anything, but we really, we're, we're at the mercy of every moment. And the second you accept that, I guess it's accepting that we're all going to die. Yeah. <laughs> the second you ac accept that we there's really, you're not in control, I think the easier life is to live. Yeah, that's one beautiful thing about Saul that I just mm. loved was he, you know, the idea where he's just like, listen, I got like half an hour left of good time in my life where I'm going to be somebody you'd want to hang out with. Don't you kind of want to just hang out with it's me? A good time. <laughs> Let's have a good time. I got half an hour and yeah, send me away. <laughs> Let's just talk about, I, I saved this for the end um, because I didn't want the whole conversation to center around the subject. But let's just talk about in in rounding out the conversation about the dementia part of it and the softness and the humanity that is given to the character of Saul in this film. He is not in a place where he doesn't know who he is. He's not in a place where he doesn't know that that's not his house. You know, he may forget what he did yesterday or a couple of days before, but he's very he's very present, but not at the agitation stages of dementia where they they get angry when they can't grasp on to what the past was and yeah. I want to know from both of you how important it was for you all to treat this character that way with that type of respect and dignity within the confines of the script and your crafting of these characters and the relationship between Saul and Sylvia. I not only think about the people who have dementia that are going through experiences that are unique, each and every one of them. You know, it is from having talked to Dr. Whitehouse, who I worked with on this film. He, the first thing he told me was like, it's make it as individual as every character that you play. This affects everyone differently. And that's the first thing to know. The second thing that I really thought about was the families of the people who have dementia. And that there would be some real value in playing someone who's at more at the beginning of this experience. Because I think this is actually the time that some people even go through where everyone's in denial about it. Oh, we forgot that again. <laughs> he got lost outside. Okay. You know, people limp along for quite some time without acknowledging what it is. So this is what it can look like. This is one example. And, um, you know, it's also that just because you've now labeled it doesn't mean there's a bunch of restrictions that you need to apply to this person. They could, if they were living their life, parts of it in a way that made sense and worked for them before, they can probably do it today. You don't need to like stop them from doing it. One of the guys that I talked to on the phone weekly who had dementia drove, was still driving last time I talked to him. And he was a guy who had post-it notes around his house. So he said, I said, you know, what do you do if you get lost? And he said, before I leave, it goes into my thing, my map thing. I have two map things. I know to follow that. You know, there might come a time where he doesn't know to follow the blue line anymore and that you reassess, but to treat people where they are, where they actually are in their lives. And there's a group called Reimagining Dementia that um, Dr. Whitehouse is part of, and they're doing just that, like, let's reimagine, let's not just take what we've seen in movies, which we tend to imitate in life unconsciously, but like, what is your specific situation with dementia? How are you going to reimagine it, you know? And also, Pete, you have a personal connection because your uncle- And my uncle had dementia, and he was probably the- <laughs> the most joyful person in my family so this is a guy who to the last day of his life was never had the anger stuff that i encountered he just wasn't a guy that got that way and this is a guy who had cte right uh -huh. From, so that's frequently associated with violent outbursts but no he he wasn't like that so just to just to because doctors have to treat illnesses we have to label them and group them, but this one in particular is a spectrum of experience. Did you have anything to add, Jessica? 
Uh, well, I mean, in playing Sylvia, I think it, she she spends her life taking care of others in terms of her job. Uh, and it, that's what made sense to me. Like, why does she go outside in the morning and get his phone and call the brother? I mean, she is someone, why does she go back into the park and find him um, when she thinks he did these terrible things? She is someone who cares about other people and, and wants to protect other people, even, even when they the world hasn't protected her. She is a good person. Uh, and I think because of what she does for a living, where she works, I think it makes perfect sense that she would see Saul as a human being um, separate from uh, dementia, but separate from the condition that he has. Just like he sees her as a human being separate from her history and her trauma. Right. She is not trauma and I am not dementia. We even say things like this when we speak about people. Sometimes they'll say, oh, that's schizophrenic. Mm. Mm. Instead of that person who happens to have schizophrenia, we we tend to or schizo schizo. I mean, yeah. we tend to use these kind of labels to just file people into different sections. Of course, being an actor, that's the opposite of what we do. Exactly. I think that's a really good point, Peter, that this is a, a disease that shouldn't be labeled, you know, and we do have a tendency and a habit of labeling things. It's just a part, it's a different part of life and a different chapter of life. And some people live through that and some people don't. I personally am someone who has lived through it a few times. So I understand and have empathy and patience and love and care for my family members that um, experience that. So watching this film was a very personal experience for me from that vantage point. And so in closing out our conversation, I'd like to thank both of you for bringing such humanity and respect and dignity to that disease by portraying it in a way that we don't often see on film or if ever. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate you both. And mm -hmm. also, I didn't want the conversation to end without congratulating you, Peter, on your um, Best Actor Award at the Venice International Film Festival. <laughs> I love that. Congratulations. I'm hoping that this is not the last I'm speaking to you guys about this, nor will it be the last that anybody hears anyone speaking about the film because it's brilliant and it was beautiful. And I appreciate both of you and what you did in the confines of the film. Thank you so much. Very, very much. Mm -hmm. Pleasure to talk to you. Yes, absolutely. I am Carla Renata, the moderator. You have been part of Film Independent Presents, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.